Have you noticed how important the monks and the abbey are in our drama? Where does Thomas Galloway take his woe? It's to the abbey. And where does the wounded soldier want to go? To the abbey. The churches and the abbeys must have been really wealthy. I mean, just look at the size of this place. It certainly makes a change from the Galloway's house. It took years to build abbeys and monasteries like these, as the builders had to do nearly everything by hand. And look at the details the stonemasons included in their work. You can still see ruined monasteries in different parts of Scotland. Some of them have been standing for more than 700 years, and at the time of our story, they were the centres of power and wealth in the area, with the monks in charge. Not all monasteries are ruins. This one has been restored and it's home to a community of monks today. Father Giles, tell me, what does it involve being a monk today? Spending your day, four hours or so of it, in church praying and worshipping God. If you look at the monastery, you can see the biggest lump, so to speak, of the building is the church. That tells you what's the biggest and most important thing in our life. monks are no longer a power in the land. Today they spend a lot of their time praying and reading. They also work organising the day-to-day -day running of the abbey. In some ways life in this abbey is the same as it was at the time of our story. The service is the same, the hymns are the same, but the last thing I'd expect in such a peaceful place is a group of soldiers marching in. So what made life different for monks in years gone by? 750 years ago, if people wanted health care, they came to a monastery. If there weren't any hotels, so when they were travelling, they came to monasteries. And the church was the only body that looked after a lot of these things. Often, the amount of money that the church had in those days was an obstacle. Uh, it made life difficult. It made people think more about looking after money than about looking after people. In our story, Thomas Galloway brings wool to the abbey to pay his rent. They used to call this payment a tind, but monks weren't the only people who owned land. Other people paid tines to their landlords, who were noblemen living in castles. So the richest and most powerful landowners were the ones who collected the most tines. Have a look at the map. Here's the castle. Can you see how near it is to England? Did the castle's owner expect enemies like King Edward of England to attack? Why else would the castle be surrounded by water? And from the top of the towers, he would get a good view of the countryside, as well as being able to see any enemies heading his way. Wouldn't it be brilliant to be a rich nobleman living in a castle like this hundreds of years ago? But what about enemies that want to take over the castle? You can deal with a few, but what if there are hundreds of them?
Everywhere I look, I'm surrounded by the enemy. Well, they can't get in because the whole castle's completely surrounded by water. Mind you, I can't escape. I can't get past them. So what am I going to do? I surrender! When King Edward and his army marched through Scotland, they set out to seize all the major castles on their way up to the north of the country. By controlling the castles, they were also in control of the surrounding land. Their journey, of course, would have taken them a lot longer than my journey today. Remember, there were no cars or big roads in the days of Robert the Bruce. If you wanted to get somewhere quickly, your best bet was one of these. Come on then, come on, yay! Here we go. <laughs> Only the wealthy knights could afford to travel on horseback. Think about all the poor soldiers who couldn't afford horses and had to travel everywhere on foot. Edward's army continued to take over more castles on their way back from the north of Scotland. What were the owners of the castles to do? If they supported the English king, they would be allowed to keep their castles and their land in Scotland. But some important noblemen own land in England as well as in Scotland. This is where Robert the Bruce owned land in Scotland, but he also owned land in England. Like many Scots, he didn't know who to support. Is it surprising then that the most important nobles in Scotland couldn't decide what to do? Should they support the English king or risk everything by fighting for Scotland? While the noblemen were still trying to make up their minds, the English army kept taking over more Scottish castles. The most important one of all was Stirling. Whoever controlled this castle was able to control all of central Scotland. The Scottish position seemed hopeless. All the most important castles, including this one, Stirling Castle, were in the hands of the English. One man decided to fight back against the English. His name was William Wallace. led an untrained army against the English at Stirling Bridge, near where this bridge is today. Imagine what it would be like. You're coming over the bridge and you know that when you get to the other side, you'll come face to face with the enemy. It was a great victory for the Scots against a bigger and better trained army. But one victory didn't mean the Scots were free. By the time of our story, the English army are in control again. But is it in the interests of the Scots, like Thomas Galloway, to accept the English? Or should they try to throw them out?